Look, business is messy. It's not easy. There's always going to be challenges that arise. And whoever presents themselves as like this perfect depiction of having it all together, like I would raise the flag on that and say, I don't know about that because I'm the most successful people that I know are constantly dealing with new problems and new challenges. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. This is Emily, executive producer of the Game Changing Attorney podcast, and today we're flipping the script for a special edition episode to get Michael's take on the most common mistakes that leaders make and how to avoid them, why respect is earned by achieving results, and how to combat complacency and keep the fire burning. What if there was a way to be able to run your practice in a way and have the support so that you could focus on the parts that you enjoy doing that are your strengths and you had other people focus on the things that are not your strengths but perhaps would be their strengths and if you didn't have to deal with any of the downsides and the things that suck the energy out of you and you could only focus on the things that bring you energy, well then why would you ever retire? That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Well, Michael, welcome to your own podcast. I'm excited to be here. The Ask Michael Mogul Anything segment. We got such great feedback on the last one that we had to do it again. So Emily, anyway, if you could please explain what this is, what we do here. Yes, totally, totally, totally. So I am Emily Housley. I am the producer of the show and I am flipping from behind the scenes to behind the microphone because we get thousands of you all that listen in every week and you all send tons and tons of questions for Michael. You should talk about this on a podcast. You should talk about that on a podcast. How do I X, Y, Z, blah, 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 blah. So much so that we decided to start this awesome AMA, Ask Me Anything segment of the podcast, but we're going to call it AMMA because it is Ask Michael (laughs) Mogul Anything. Yes, and it is clever. So you asked, we answered, and today's questions are courtesy of you all. So if you have a question that you would like to ask Michael on the show, text him at 404-531-7691 and you just might hear it on the next episode. Just don't make it weird. (laughs) No, please make it weird. Those always make for the funner answers. There you go. (laughs) All right. You ready to get this one going? Let's do it. All right. Question number one comes from Trevor. In your opinion, what is the most foolish leadership or management trend that you have seen popularized, be it in or beyond the legal industry? And what alternative would you recommend that others like myself take? Again, this is the Ask Michael Mogul Anything, so these are just my opinions, and you may disagree, and that's okay. I think there's quite a lot of them. If you go on LinkedIn, and you start looking at these LinkedIn thought leaders writing out their like long-form blog posts, and today, I had a thought, and then I realized that at the end of the day, you just gotta love yourself, and everyone's like, 30,000 likes, like, yes, yes, that's all you gotta do, you just gotta love yourself, or it'll be somebody with tears down their eyes and say, today I had to make the very difficult decision of laying off my entire team, and I take full responsibility, no shit, no shit, it's your fault, I mean, it's your company, you just laid off these people, right, and they're posting some LinkedIn posts about how you're so remorseful about it and they're saying, oh, how vulnerable of you, right? And yet all these people are now without jobs. They're just like screwed. Oh man, what a brave leader. So if you're still listening to the podcast at this point, I think there's a lot of just foolish trends in the sense that they come from people and you don't know if that advice or feedback or experience is coming from someone, let's say, believable. You don't know the amount of money in their bank account. You don't know what's really going on in their business. You don't know what's really going on in their team. I think sometimes you can look at a business and think, well, from the outside, it looks amazing. But then if you ever dive in inside, what an absolute disaster, right? And I know this from experience because 
remember years ago, this was us. We were winning all these awards and everything looked wonderful. And inside it was just, we were pulling our hair out. We were outgrowing processes. We were dealing with turnover, all sorts of different challenges. And I share that because look, business is messy. It's not easy. There's always going to be challenges that arise. And whoever presents themselves as like this perfect depiction of having it all together, I would raise the flag on that and say, I don't know about that because I'm the most successful people that I know are constantly dealing with new problems and new challenges. So if we're talking about a foolish leadership trend, I mean, two come to mind. One, I think you see this less now than we used to, and is this idea of just buying love. So if you have, a, say, a member of your team, they come to you, they're unhappy that you believe that you are somehow responsible for their happiness and leaders believing that they are responsible for the happiness of their team members. Well, I've got news for you. You are not in control of anybody's happiness. Now, what you can control is providing clarity. What you can control is accountability, giving somebody a path to learning and growing and being able to be successful in your organization. But you can't control how they come in there on Monday morning, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You don't control what's going on in their life. If they're unhappy, usually has absolutely nothing to do with your organization. And you think, well, how can I just improve the morale? Like, what's the saying? It's like the beatings will continue until morale improves, right? It's like... (laughs) Come on, like that's not on you to be in control of anybody's happiness. So when I see leaders saying, well, we're going to buy this and we're going to get them this and we're going to get them a couch and we're going to have a refrigerator and a ping pong table and a ski ball machine or whatever it is. And they're like, I tried to get them everything. We got beer on tap at our office and why aren't they happy? And it's like, because you're not in control of their happiness. This human being is miserable and unfulfilled. That may have absolutely nothing to do with you. Instead, you should be focusing on how can I have accountability within my organization and have high standards and that's going to work for some people, the right people, and it's not going to work for the other people. But again, your job as a leader is to provide clarity, just to be equitable, to have fairness, to have transparency, all these things, and to give somebody the opportunity to succeed in your organization, to set them up for success, to have the right training and development, to have the right onboarding. But beyond that, Look, it's on them. You can't control anybody's effort. You can't teach the work ethic. So if they're not willing to do the things that are necessary to be successful in your organization and you've empowered them to do the things so they know, how can I be successful in my role? You provided that. How am I measured? You provided the KPIs. How can I be trained? You provided that. They've got full clarity. They can succeed and they don't. Well, that's on them. So that's number one. If I can give a second answer, maybe it's this idea that like right now it's interesting as a society that there's this negative attitude towards capitalism, this negative view towards profit. And they're thinking, wow, uh, as business leaders and even small business leaders, like we're all sitting in the back room smoking cigars saying, oh, what a wonderful time it is. And like people are so expendable. You're rolling in cash and, and money and profit, like profit's a bad thing. Well, Knowing quite a few small business owners, I can tell you that it's actually quite the opposite. You usually have somebody that takes this massive risk, that starts a business, that's working 100 hours a week, that finally hires some people, that then is working every single day to make sure that they have enough work and the opportunity to grow. Then you're also then providing them with benefits and health insurance for their family. Then you're providing them with long-term career paths. Then you're trying to figure out everything. And then at the end of it all, you're like, okay, whatever's left, let me pay myself. Let's say a big case settles or a big deal comes into a business and sometimes... I think from the outside, if you're on LinkedIn, you think, well, that went straight to the firm owner. Yeah, after that pizza got chopped up 12 ways, you get like one quarter slice at the end by the time it hits your account, right? After it went to paying all the overheads, after it went to taxes, after it went to paying everyone's payroll, then the benefits, then all the infrastructure, then the software, then the marketing to bring in new cases, all these things. Like by the time it gets to you, it's it's usually not a whole lot, at least off any one case or any one deal. So there's nothing wrong with turning a profit. A business should be profitable. In fact, I don't know know that a business is healthy when it's not profitable. You look at this wave of layoffs happening now across various companies that you would think, man, if I can only get a job at the number one most successful SaaS company, publicly traded company in the world, Salesforce, I'd be looking pretty good. Boom, layoffs, right? Well, maybe at Google, layoffs. Maybe at Amazon, nope, they're going to lay off there too. Well, maybe at Meta, nope, layoffs there too. Everywhere they're doing layoffs at places you would think are traditionally going to have a lot of stability and security and all these different things in the the truth is they don't. So when you're growing a business, particularly a small business, that business being profitable means that perhaps it's being run in a way where you're able to continue to invest in the growth of that business in the future, to be able to have additional opportunities for your team, to be able to continue to grow. But there's nothing wrong with profit. 
I think a lot of times where people view it as a negative thing is if they see that it's only the owner benefits. Instead, perhaps you can create a structure in your organization like we've always had at Crisp for the last seven, eight years or so where we do a team profit share, mm -hmm. right? So we want to be able to share. We have value sharing in the sense that if you not just perform in your role, but if you drive additional value for the organization, we want to share in that value. And I believe that's the right thing to do. It shouldn't be just me winning. It should be the entire organization winning. And in fact, I win last, right? And when we lose, I lose first. So that's all always been the case. So I would view a lot of the things that you read on a, on, a, on a platform like LinkedIn with a grain of salt, because anyone can write anything. Anyone can make any situation seem a certain way. But the reality of it is, if you solely look at that without doing any sort of, hmm, I wonder what is true here, or you don't know what, what's really going on in that business, or what's really like in this person's bank account, if they are truly successful, you may be leading yourself astray. So a lot of times it's just making sure that you are getting the right information for the right people, right? So knowing people that have proven success, me, I'm the type of person, I gotta see it with my own eyes. I gotta see it. I gotta see what their organization looks like. I gotta see what their people look like. I gotta see everything, what's going on. And then, then I can trust that the results that they're talking about are real. And if they're real, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna listen to everything because I see someone who's way ahead of me, way more successful than me. They know things that I don't know. And I can make a lot of great leaps if I learn from them and I take their feedback. But if it's just some random person that has like a little influencer badge on LinkedIn saying, just love them. <laughs> right. And then you know, before you know it, you know, two months later, they're the one doing layoffs and saying, I feel so vulnerable. It's all my fault. I just had to lay off my entire team. Well, I don't know that I bet on that human being. No disrespect. No disrespect. And I mean, that's completely true. And one of the best pieces of advice that I've gotten from you that you got from someone else was don't take advice from people that don't have the results. So I think we should all just kind of question our responses and reactions to certain things, especially the ones that go, quote unquote, viral. Yes. <laughs> LinkedIn influencers. <laughs> I'm not picking on LinkedIn, by the way. I'm just picking on the, all the fugazi out there. Oh, you just don't know. <laughs> You don't know. Like, like I want to see how somebody lives. I want to see what their life is like. I want to see how they treat their kids, what their family is like. I want to see what their team is like. I mean, it's, I know this sounds a little invasive, but it, there's just a lot of nonsense out there and they've got so many followers. This doesn't go for everyone. I mean, there's a lot of, like, I think, really great trusted individuals that have built strong brands. But there's also just as many, probably 10 times as many people that have built their brand on what was the expression? There was a saying that one of the best ways to make a million dollars is to write a book on how to make a million dollars. Right. <laughs> so like, one, this was very important for us. Me, me at Crisp, like before we even entered the coaching space, we like put it off for so many years because I never wanted to make our money giving advice, right? I didn't want it to be like, okay, we're gonna grow just through the advice business. Uh, that's, it was nonsense. Like, let's build a great business that's profitable, that drives revenue, scale a great team. And then once we've done all those things, and as we continue to grow, share the things that we've learned and those insights, but not someone coming out there and saying, hey, by giving advice, that's how I'm going to make my money. Yeah, not a fan. Awesome, all right, next question. Ooh, this is one of my favorites. How do you expect people to take you seriously when you wear jeans, a t-shirt, and a hoodie to work every day? And this question is courtesy of Shannon. So right now, if you're watching this podcast, I am wearing jeans and sneakers and a hoodie, a crisp hoodie and a crisp shirt, actually, by the way. So how do I expect people to take me seriously? Well, I would say that the main thing for me has always been action speaking louder in words. Your results are going to dictate whether people take you seriously or not. Not necessarily like whether you're wearing a t-shirt or a hoodie when you're coming into the office. Now I've dressed up, whether we have a big conference, we have workshops or whatever it is, and you've known this and we, over the years, I have progressively not necessarily dressed down, but my wardrobe has become simpler <laughs> in that, I mean, every day it, it's a crisp hoodie, some different colors, right? I got like a red one, a blue one, a purple one, a black one, a white one, whatever. And then under it, I'm wearing a crisp shirt. I'm wearing our brand. This one today, says indecisiveness is weakness, but we've got a whole lot of other ones and it's just simple and not a whole lot of thought is involved when I'm getting up and getting out in the morning because one, it's comfortable, but two, it's something that does not occupy a lot of like mental thought, right? I was just I like about to, to say, it's one less decision that you have to make. Exactly, exactly. I mean, we're making- God, you make a ton of decisions every day, Michael. Constantly. Oh and there's God. some, I mean, some that are way more impactful than others. So I don't want to, one, waste that mental load. And I'm not trying to sound fancy when I say this or whatever it is. I'm not trying to be like Mark Zuckerberg or one of these Silicon Valley people. It's just at the end of the day, what is the most important thing? 
Is it whether you're wearing a hoodie or like a suit when you're coming to the office or your results and your consistency and your track record and all these different things. And look, if somebody came into our office and they're wearing jean shorts and a crop top or whatever it is, and they've got incredible results, I'm more interested in hearing what they have to say and what things that they've done and learning from them than I am like in taking fashion advice from them, whatever that might be. But I would say that there's nothing wrong with dressing up every day when you go into the office, nothing wrong with it whatsoever. It's just, that's not as important as being consistent in your actions, being consistent in your results, having great outcomes. Mark Lanier, who's on the podcast, like if she, he shows up to work in a hoodie and sneakers and jeans, no one bats an eye because he's Mark Appen Lanier. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Because at the end of the day, like he's just a phenomenal trial attorney who's had incredible results and incredible outcomes. He can wear whatever he wants. And I've got like two young girls and I would say focus on your value and the value you provide in this world way more than just what you're going to wear today because you don't ever want that to fall out of balance. When I was starting out as a business leader, I remember that I don't know necessarily that I could show up to a meeting in a hoodie and jeans and someone professional would take me as seriously or I could, but then, you know, they real answer to this question is, even if I did and I could do it, I would have to make up so much ground and trust with them before I was even on the same baseline level. So before, I didn't want to make things more difficult for myself. Now, I don't mind overcoming that. So it's not as big of a deal, right? So I can just wear whatever I want. But when you're starting out, it's like, look, if you're going to show up and you're going to be dressed down or whatever, just know that you're going to have to make up some ground and traction with your audience before they may take you seriously or as seriously as they would if you were dressed in like a suit. So you don't want to make things more difficult for yourself initially but then once you get to a certain point you know as you start to grow it becomes more down to like you decide what you want to do you decide what you want to wear you decide where you want to be who you want to be with how you want to spend your time and for me it's a function of freedom and if it makes me feel more comfortable I'm going to do it and if you don't like it (laughs) you don't have to listen that's all good I love it I love it. All right. So that's number two. Last one. Right. Number three. Oh, I guess this is kind of expanding on uh, the t-shirts in a little bit. But David asks, you are big on always moving forward. We've seen this a lot with the themes for crisp events, never complacent, play bigger, evolve. And it's apparent on a lot of your swag, t-shirts reading better than yesterday and future greater than past. I am currently wearing a crisp shirt that says limitless. So my question is, what are your thoughts on traditional retirement? and the current traditional retirement mindset. When most people think of retirement, I believe they think that I'm going to work up until a certain point, up until a certain age, and then I'm going to stop, and then I'm going to then enjoy the rest of my life, or whatever it is. I think that is a very broken approach because, well, first of all, statistically, we're seeing people that are now working longer and longer and longer. Years ago, you'd have like pensions and things like that at organizations. Now, those have largely fallen by the wayside. So, you know, what used to be retirement at, let's say, 55, people are in their 60s now in their 70s still thinking about retirement and they start postponing how they want to live their life and how they want to spend their time. And the retirement becomes like almost like this this horizon that they're constantly chasing. And it's also this idea that retirement means that you want to stop doing what you're doing or that you don't enjoy what you're doing or how you're spending your time, which in a sense is is almost like a paradox because why would you spend your time in a way for a long duration of time? Let's say you're in your 40s, 50s, 60s, and absolutely like that be contradictory with how you actually want to spend your time. Like if you don't enjoy what you're doing and you're constantly looking for the exits, then perhaps you should be doing something else. And that doesn't mean like, you know, you should just be sitting around drinking beer, playing golf all day or whatever it is. It just comes down to where you're at in your career or let's say you're running a law firm and there's just constant stress and headache and you just can't wait to be done with it. Well, what if there was a way to be able to run your practice in a way and have the support so that you could focus on the parts that you enjoy doing that are your strengths and you had other people focus on the things that are not your strengths but perhaps would be their strengths and if you didn't have to deal with any of the downsides and the things that suck the energy out of you and you could only focus on the things that bring you energy, well then why would you ever retire? So if you look up the traditional definition of retirement, it's like to put out of use, right? Right? This is what they do with old toys. And, and that means that you're constantly in a state where eventually trying to say, well, down the line, I'm going to do the things I really want to do. Well, what if you did those things today? And what if you could structure your life in a way where, and again, this isn't just some fantasy thing that I'm proposing. Like, you know, I know so many business leaders that lead their lives this way because they've hired not necessarily to grow their business. They've hired to free up their time. And by freeing up their time, they've been able to grow their business. It almost seems counterintuitive, but that's how they've done it. So to me, 
I never want to retire because then what happens? I, I mean, I said it on a, on a vlog a few months back. It's like, okay, let's say retirement for some people is on a beach and they're drinking a margarita. Okay, wonderful. You do that. You feel pretty good. Maybe a week goes by, maybe a month goes by, maybe two months go by. And then what? At some point you're like, all right, well, what am I going to do next? Right? And if you're like most people, especially most entrepreneurs, you're constantly got that itch and that next problem to solve, that next you know creative pursuit, whatever it is that you want to be doing, then you jump right back into it. So, so when people say retire, maybe what they mean sometimes is I really just want to break. You know, I could use a break right now, but does it mean I want to stop completely? Maybe not, especially not if they could get all the things they don't do enjoy doing off their plate. So I think that we have to shift our view of retirement. And what if you could just spend your time doing the things that you enjoy, that add value, that challenge you, that cause you to grow, like, you know, and that was your life. Let's say 90% of the time, maybe 100% of the time, well, then you never want to retire. And every day could be an exciting day. Maybe not every day, right? There's going to be days that suck, but you're not going to be looking for the exits. And then also with many people, by the time they finally do retire, let's say they're 70, 80 years old, whatever traditional retirement, at that point, you're really able to enjoy the things that you have, the life that you have, right? Because maybe your health isn't where it needs to be. Maybe you don't have the same level of energy and vitality to do things you want to do. So I believe you should be pursuing those things today, like now, right? Like you should be focusing on your health now. Like treat your body like a house you have to live in for another 70 years, mm -hmm. right? So that way you look at it and say, instead of me looking forward to some future 20 years from now, why, why can't I not just structure my life today to do that? And maybe it's not overnight. It's a process that you get there over a period of months, maybe over a period of years. It's taken me quite a while, but I now view it from the standpoint of if I can focus on doing the things that I enjoy, that bring me energy, solving the types of problems that I enjoy solving in the business, and then on top of that, I've got the personal things that I enjoy. I can focus on my health. I can be with my daughters. I can be with my wife, all those things. Well, then why would I ever want to retire? Retire from what? I love it. it. Brings me energy. It brings me joy. Every day's a new challenge. I don't want someone to be wheeling me around in like some old community and saying, "Well, here's Michael, right? Like, did you feed him today? Right? Did you plug him in?" No. Come on. I'm gonna keep going as long as I can until they cut me off. Well, that's three questions. That's three answers, man. So I know next time we're gonna talk about what you're doing to like stay young and and active and in shape and all that stuff. Man, you got me got me thinking about this. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about it. There ain't no secrets, really, but I'm excited to talk about what my routine has been. We've had a lot of really incredible guests on the podcast that I know you've have gotten talked tons about ideas just from them. the science of longevity, and they've talked about everything from exercise to diet to all the different things that you can do. So excited to get into it. All right. Well, we will see you all next time. Again, if you have a question that you would like to ask Michael on this podcast, send him a text at 404-531-7691. Emily Housley signing off. Thank you, Michael. My pleasure. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney podcast with Michael Mogul. If you found this episode valuable, here are three free ways that we can help you grow your law firm. Number one, download the first chapter of Michael's book at gamechangingattorney.com. Number two, shoot Michael a text at 404-531-7691 and ask him any question you'd like. You might just hear the answer on the next episode. And finally, number three, leave this podcast a five-star review so we can gain access to more influential thought leaders and bring their lessons learned here to you. For more information on this episode, see the show notes in your podcast app or visit gamechangingattorney.com. Thank you.